Uh, now, uh, real quick, I want to get back to the ascension of Isaiah. Can we briefly go over what that text says and why it's important to the writings that we find in, uh, say, the epistles of Paul and uh, Hebrews uh, as being uh, sort of, a, I guess, maybe a, a story um, or a tradition that these other texts may be referencing. So can you go over what this text is all about? Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated text because we only have corrupted versions of it. Uh, we don't have the original. Uh, and we know there was an original because we can tell through various manuscript comparisons and stuff that people are messing with it over time. Uh, and so reconstructing the original is a challenge. Uh, but we have we have enough evidence to reconstruct it, reconstruct what it looked like roughly around the time that the canonical gospels were being written. Uh, and so like that's between r- roughly 80 AD and 120 AD in that period there. The ascension of Isaiah took a form at that point. Uh, that we can sort of reconstruct from existing uh, exemplars. And uh, and so we can see what looks like it's a competing strand of Christianity. The, the text originally, it got doctored later to have the historicist Christianity inserted into it. Uh, but originally that stuff wasn't in there. And so it, it was sort of a competing sect of Christianity that's different from the canonical gospels and what they're doing. And in Ascension of Isaiah, the story is that Isaiah, the actual Isaiah from way back in you know ancient times, even from their point of view, he left his body and ascended to heaven and the angel, an angel took him up, took his soul up to heaven and showed him all of things in the future. This is what's going to happen. And he, the angel explains to him that this, this is what you're going to see. And then Isaiah sees it. And then eventually Isaiah returns to his body. And uh, the, the legend is he didn't write it down or tell anybody, but obviously the Ascension of Isaiah exists. So someone must've written it down, you know, in concept. Uh, uh, so it's, this is actually therefore an ancient prophecy of Isaiah predicting Christianity. And, and in that narrative, Jesus is uh, this archangel. He is the archangel of archangels. He is the, the oldest and original created being living up in uh, the seventh heaven with God. And God instructs him to go down uh, and assume a body, get killed and come back up so that we can defeat Satan. Uh, and so Jesus does this. And in, in the original version, it looks like uh, that it's Satan and his demons who killed Jesus, that he never goes all the way to earth. Later versions of the text inserted sort of ridiculous little gospels inside there where he goes all the way to earth and does all of these things. Uh, but those we can show that those texts weren't originally a part of the text of Ascension of Isaiah. And so, so this looks like this the exact version of it where you have Jesus goes through the seven levels of heaven, becomes incarnate, is killed just below the orbit of the moon, just like Osiris is, and then resurrects and gains power over death and yada, yada. Uh, and so that that's the relevance of it. Unfortunately, because it's so doctored, uh, and we, we don't really have a firmly datable uh, early version of it. We can't use it very strongly as evidence. And so what in on the history of Jesus, I use it very weakly. It has almost no effect on the probability uh, that I come up with. But it is relevant for showing proof of concept. It shows that right. there were people thinking like this. Whether you think they were the original Christians or later Christians, it doesn't matter. The whole point is this existed. This kind of idea existed. And so it's it's important for showing that. Uh, and yeah. that's how I use the text in on the historicity of Jesus. I think I barely even mention it in Jesus from Outer Space, ironically, uh, because I don't want to trigger people. Because uh, it's a lot of people get get freaked out about the Ascension of Isaiah. And they're like, oh, that's a heretical text, late heretical text, and you know, there's a lot of con- arguments over which version of the text is authentic and so on. Just avoid all of that. We don't need it. Uh, we we can make the case without it, uh, and that's what I do in Jesus from Outer Space. Yeah, it, it's a uh, it's a fun text to read, and uh, especially like its similarities to the descent of Anana and the, this this multi tiered dissension and the gradual uh, stripping of divinity along the way. It, yeah, uh, it's it's fascinating. Ending that. in a death and resurrection, uh, right, mm-hmm. and ascension, right. So it's, it yeah. is very much the same story. Whoever wrote the original Ascension of Isaiah clearly was inspired by Anana cult teachings. And they were just adapting them to their own particular Jewish version of it. Uh, I think there's really no, I mean, it's just obvious to me that that's what's, what's going on there. Uh, one can argue as to when that happened, uh, but it's, it's clear that it did because the, the parallels are too strong. Uh, the, 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 the coincidence is not explicable. Like you, the coincidence is highly improbable, let's put it that way. Whereas direct influence actually is a much more probable hypothesis. Right. And we know uh, the Anana cult was still going at the time. We have very little texts that survive from it, but it was still a thing. And it was actually one of the major cults at Tyre, which is where Jesus is depicted as going to visit. And Tyre is the major port, one of the major port accesses to Judea. 
so so that it's this people definitely knew about this in cult. They knew they knew more about it than we do, because uh, we know that cult was thriving at the time, uh, right adjacent to Judea. And I believe the Old Testament actually complains about the presence of the Anana cult. Yeah, uh, I, I could be getting that. I, I think they do. Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel yeah, complains yeah. about the... Actually, there's a lot of this, by the way, in the Old Testament. There's a lot of examples of complaining about pagan worship among Jews. Uh, right, so, right. so Israelites were not consistent monotheists at all. Uh, uh, but the Bible tries to portray them as, oh, those are... Uh, fringe rebels that are doing bad things. It's like, no, actually you're, what you're describing, we know is the actual way Israel was, and you're just complaining right, about right. it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the, the, in this case, they, he, Ezekiel complains about the women weeping for Temuz. Uh, and this is part of the, the, the ritual cycle for Inanna. Um, Cause in the Inanna myth, Inanna descends through the seven levels in this case of hell uh, and is, is stripped down until she's naked and then she's killed and then crucified. And then three days later she rises and ascends. But when she ascends, she uh, replaces herself with her husband, Tammuz. For some reason, she's angry with him. And uh, we don't have that part of the myth. So we don't know exactly what went on. But uh, she conde- she has him condemned to hell. So he gets torn down to hell. And then everybody, there, there's weeping uh, for the, the sending to hell of Tammuz. So the women who are weeping for, the, for, weeping for Tammuz and Ezekiel are the ones who are engaging in this ritual, representing this myth. Uh, and, and there was also possibly a myth in which Tammuz also escapes and resurrects, but that's harder to establish. It's vaguer. Um, but we do know that this this ties into the Inanna cult myth. So so that's that's the actual case. Uh, so we know Inanna cult had reached J- Jerusalem, and there were practitioners of that cult there uh, because Ezekiel references them. 